Once again, it's on. You know what time it is. It's time to play some Toss. Welcome, everyone, to episode 119 of Toss, the Trisha on Sports Show. It is your main man, T-Squared, Tristan Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. This week, the Packers embarrassed the G on their helmet. Real adversity within the ranks of the Green Bay Packers. We got to talk about it. The Milwaukee Brewers, president of baseball operations, finally admits he was wrong. We'll discuss. Milwaukee Bucks are about to start their season. We'll talk about how they're going to have to tread water. What do I mean by that? We'll discuss. And then the tall sweep, the sporting news has come out with their predictions for the NBA season. Oh, you know, I got to take a look at them, see if they did their homework right. But you all know how we get things started here on Toss. We get things started with the state of the state. And let's talk about those Green Bay Packers, those struggling. Yeah, I said it, struggling Green Bay Packers. And I call them struggling because of what happened this past Sunday. I just I'm I'm at a loss for words, and that's that's a rarity. The Packers, they 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 didn't just lose, they didn't just lose. They got their asses whooped, and for that they catch one of these. <laughs> They got whizzaxed, dog walked, stomped by the New York Jets, the Baby Jets, who after this victory are now four and two, and very much in the thick of things in the AFC East. Meanwhile, and, and before I even get back to Green Bay Packers, all the credit in the world to the Jets. I said it on Quick Toss, which you can catch on YouTube. Just look us up, Toss Nation Media. I said it on Quick Toss that the Jets were a scrappy team. They're three and two. That defense is starting to take on the whole team, really, but especially that defense is starting to take on the, the personality of their head coach, Robert Sala. They have some talent. I mentioned how the Packers have run into Sala's defenses out in San Francisco. It hasn't really fared well for them. They don't quite have that sort of talent yet, but they're getting there. They're believing, they're building something. You got some pieces on defense, you got some pieces on offense. Gabriel Davis, oh, excuse me, not Gabriel Davis. Thinking about the Buffalo Bills. But you got Brees Hall. Zach Wilson came back from injury. He's been playing pretty well since he's been back. That was a scrappy team. And I warned that they were a scrappy team. And I warned that scrappy teams tend to hang around. And if you have listened to this program, if you have looked at anything on my social media, especially Twitter, at the 20 double, you know that I don't like when teams hang around. Because teams hanging around, you leaving the door wide open, not even a crack. You're leaving it wide open for them to just walk through and snatch a victory from you. And that's exactly what happened. The Jets didn't just squeak by. They went and they took the victory because the Packers are struggling. They are struggling mightily. So all the credit in the world to the baby Jets, they came in and they absolutely dominated in the trenches. They found something that they could do offensively that the Packers could not stop, mainly the running game. Brees Hall, 20 carries, 116 yards and a touchdown. He's a good-looking rookie. Braxton Burials with the with the reverse for the touchdown. I mean, it, what the I, I would say what the hell is going on here, but I, I will let Vince Lombardi have that one. It is just absolutely flabbergasting how the same mistakes are continuously made week after week after week by this Green Bay Packers squad. It's literally the same old song offensively 
from Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers. And, yes, I'm throwing Aaron Rodgers in there. And it's not because of his play on the field, even though <laughs> that, that is very much a part of it. But we'll discuss why I put him in there in just a second. LaFleur's play calling. is suspect right now. This offense is stuck in the mud. After Sunday's game, they're averaging just over 19 points per game. Remember when Matt LaFleur was hired and he had those anemic numbers as offensive coordinator of the Rams and the Titans, and everyone's like, he's supposed to be a great play caller, he, he's supposed to have this great offense, and he's now being a head coach of the Green Bay Packers who are so accustomed to putting up points at will against anyone. If there's one thing you could count on is you could count on a potent offense from the Green Bay Packers. And now you're going to bring in this guy who has anemic numbers as a offensive coordinator. What are we doing? Everyone had those concerns. And then the first year, yeah, it was a bit of a struggle to score points, but they won 13 games. In the second year, it felt a little bit easier that everybody had got acclimated to the offense and they put up a few more points. 13 games. In the third season, again, offense was flowing pretty well. They had, they had their points where they were kind of kind of scrapping it together. But then they would go on a stretch where it just was a well-oiled machine. And guess what? They won 13 games. But now this season, without a true threat to take the top off the defense. That, that guy is gone. Devontae, you traded him. He wanted to be traded. He no longer wanted to play in Green Bay. You appeased his request. Okay, that's over with. He's gone. So you as a head coach have to understand what type of team you are. You also have input on the personnel of this team, especially offensively. You've now built this team to be a run-first football team, to be a power-running football team with those two great backs in Jones and Dylan, I say it every week. I'm going to keep saying it until we see real change. You are a run-first ball club. Pass second. The passing game has to be complimentary. LaFleur said so himself after the game in his press conference. But you're not doing that. Your play calling is not sticking to what you've tried to build offensively. You've built a running team with a passing game that's complementary, especially when you're bringing along young wide receivers and other guys who haven't exactly been in the system. A Watkins, who finally returned to practice in a limited capacity just today as we record this program on a Wednesday. Your play calling is going against everything that you've built. You cannot just run the ball once or twice and then just completely abandon it when the other team has shown that they're not going to do anything to exactly stop it. Now, I will say on Sunday, running was very difficult because the Packers' offensive line was getting their asses handed to them by the Jets' defensive line. But you still have to try and keep that defense honest. So you can open it up. You are a run-first team. And when you run and run effectively, you open up play action, which we all know Aaron Rodgers is money with play action. Nine times out of ten, it, he's going to connect, and it's going to be a big play. Now, this team has shown explosiveness, but it has not resulted in points. And that's what matters at the end of the game. But in order to get those points, in order to keep those chains moving, you have to adhere to what you've built. You built a run first, pass second ball club. You cannot sit there and run the ball one time, two times on a drive, and then try to bomb it down the field unsuccessfully and think you're going to score points and win games. That's where Matt LaFleur's play calling is right now. Now, I mentioned Rodgers lumped in with that, and I'll tell you why. Again, it's not just for his play on the field, which – 
to this point, hasn't exactly been the best. Definitely not MVP level. He's not in that conversation. He's up at the line. He's reading the defense. He's checking out of run plays more times than not. This is why you have games just like this, where you have Jones and Dylan, Dylan having a combined 19 carries. One of those guys should be getting 19 carries by themselves, and the other one should be getting another 15. This is the type of team you've built. You cannot have Aaron Rodgers going out there and slinging the ball around the yard 41 times and not put points up on the board. Yeah, Lazar got the touchdown on a nice catch. Great. But overall, this offense was stuck in the mud. LaFleur, Rodgers have a big hand in it. This offensive line, Newman, I heard his name way too many times. Jenkins didn't exactly have the great day either. He'll be better, but, but, but Newman, I don't have any faith in him. I have no trust in him. Can he get better? Yeah, you certainly hope so. They seem to be wanting to stick with him. You lost Randall Cobb in that game. So now you're down a veteran wide receiver, a guy who has that chemistry after being with Rodgers for many years. Like we said, Sammy Watkins returned to practice in a limited capacity, but he's still on the IR. We don't know when Christian Watson is coming back. You're not really targeting Romeo Dobbs like you should be. Lazard is there. Tunyon is there. He had 10 catches. But it starts with the running backs. It starts with this running game, and you have to be better there because that's how you've built this offense. You cannot continue to fall in love with the deep pass and not connect. I can't tell you how maddening it is to constantly see this team dial it up to go downfield and continuously be unsuccessful. Completely abandoning the running game when there is no reason to do so. The defense. I I would say they played maybe a good quarter and a two quarters and a half. Two and a half quarters. With the football, and then the floodgates open. There's only so long this defense is going to be able to keep points up off the board. You've got to go out there and score. If they're putting in that type of work that they did in the first half and for most of that third quarter before things completely fell apart, you've got to reward them with points for their work. I equate this to Denver's defense. Denver's defense has given up six touchdowns in six games. They're two and four. You've got to reward the work that those guys are putting in defensively. It was nice to see Joe Barry finally untether Jair Alexander from being in zone and allowing him to travel. Shutting down his man. But there still was far too much zone for my liking. There were no real second half adjustments. They started to find a little bit of space in the passing game. And you're talking this, you're talking the Packers came into the into this game with the second rank passing defense in all of the NFL. If it's one thing this team is going to do, they're going to shut down the pass. But they're ranked 21st in stopping the run. That ranking has gone down even further after allowing Brees Hall 116 yards and a touchdown. 
Again, all the credit in the world to the Jets. Both of their lines started to maul the Green Bay Packers. Special teams definitely was not special. You allow a block punt for a touchdown. You allowed a blocked field goal. You went and blocked a field goal of your own. We covered that. But they're still not special. They're still a pain. You come back and it's after the game and you hear the same old tired diatribe from Matt LaFleur. Oh, we've got to be better, and it starts with me. When will you actually start? For the first time in your tenure as head coach of the Green Bay Packers, you've lost two straight games, and it does not look like this is going to end anytime soon. And we're talking the struggles offensively, because as long as you continue to struggle offensively, as long as you continue to struggle to put points up on the board, you're going to struggle to win ball games. You lost two straight. You're back two games to the Vikings in the division. I know we're only headed into week seven. And it's too early to be thinking about that, but you don't want them to get way too far out, especially when they already have a win over you. But eyes on your own paper, you need to get your house clean first. Instead of coming out with the same old tired diatribe about how we need to be better, and that starts with me, and, and those backs, especially Aaron Jones, need to get more carries, and that's on me, and I need to be better in that. When do you actually start being better? You've known these things. You've got six games under your belt. Most of them you've done this and have caught an L, three of them. The time for talk is over. The time for action is now. If you are truly serious about obtaining every single goal you have for this ball club, for your season, it's going to have to start now. You got six games of mediocrity under your belt. Instead of talking about you need to be better, how about you start being better? You have a struggling Washington Commanders team who will be without their starting quarterback cards and wins because of a fractured finger. Enter Taylor Heineke, who the Packers have played. Matt LaFleur has called him scrappy. He is. He can make plays with his arm. He can make plays with his legs. That defensive front could be a handful. You've got a challenge. This isn't an automatic win. Yeah, commanders are last in the, in the NFC East, which may very well be the best division in all of football. 6-0 and Eagles, 5-1 and Giants, 4-2 and Cowboys. You're going to have a challenge on your hands. If you truly believe that it starts with me, we got to be better, then how about you start being better right now? I'll have my prediction on Packers quick toss. That should drop Thursday or Friday. Keep it locked in these different spaces. Again, Twitter at the two zero double. Let's find out when. Let's continue here on toss state of the state. And let's talk about those green Bay. No, excuse me. We already talked about the green Bay Packers. Let's talk about the Milwaukee Brewers. I was determined, determined not to have to talk about them again until next season, because they made me so mad about how they collapsed and they were making me even madder or even more mad about the fact that they just would not admit that they were wrong about the Josh Hader trade. Well, last week, in the season press conferences happened, David Stearns, president of baseball operations, 
came out and pretty much admitted that the head of trade was wrong, which is what I had been saying on this very program, which is what many other people have been saying. Anybody with eyes had been saying. Here are a few quotes from from that press conference of what he said. Quote, the hater trade clearly had an impact on the team, you don't say. It had a more pronounced impact than I thought it would at the time, and the surrounding moves didn't adequately fortify the team in Josh's absence. End quote. We're talking about guys like Bush, Rosenthal. Those guys, not panning out, not working whatsoever. The guy you traded Hater for, Rodgers, was terrible, did not work. I said it on this program. I said it a hundred times. That Hater trade fractured the locker room. It sent out the signal to the players, and it sent out the signals to Brewers fans that they're not serious about winning. They're not serious about doing anything other than trying to make it to the playoffs and think that's sufficient. Stearns finally admitted that that trade had a more pronounced impact and the surrounding moves did not work. Here's some more, quote, instead, uh, and not not even a quote, this is basically what happened. Like, we talked about Bush, 4-3-0 ERA in the 25 games that he pitched for the Brewers. Rodgers had a 5.48 ERA in, in 24 appearances for the Brewers. Needless to say, those moves didn't work. Bush was supposed to be a high leverage guy. Well, you can't be a high leverage guy with a 4.30 ERA. Giving up leads left and right. You can't be the de facto closer in Rodgers if you're putting up 5.8, 5.48 ERA. And we know at the time that Hater was traded, he was struggling. But... As I mentioned on this program just a few weeks ago, he found it. He got it back. Now he's in postseason. Not only is he in postseason, he's deep in postseason because the Padres are in the NLCS. They're knocking on the door of the World Series right now. Obviously, Phillies won game one. They're up in the series. But they've made a deep run, and Hayter has been a huge part of that. He's been shut down as he has always been in his career. Here's more from David Stearns. Quote, I think we all get assessed. Ultimately, I am accountable for how this organization performs completely, and we didn't reach our goal this year. We didn't meet our expectations. And so I take responsibility for that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for taking responsibility for the hatchet job you did on creating and forming this team. Forgive me, that's my passion talking, but it's also the truth. Look at what they've done. Look at what they had. Look at the guys that continue to add to this team. Feast or famine guys at the plate. They were either going to hit a three-run home run or they're going to have three strikeouts. You can win some games in a regular season like that, but you're not going to win in the postseason like that. Your bullpen, you took a hatchet to that, was no longer a strength for you. Starting pitching was the greatest strength This team has. To this point, it's still the greatest strength this team has. And who knows for how much longer that's going to be because eventually you're going to have to start paying guys. The only guy that you've paid is is Peralta. Peralta and Ashby got paid, and that's it. Now, something tells me they're not going to want to pay both Woodruff and Burns. They're probably going to try to lowball Lauer. Arbitration's coming up. But that's another mess for another day. It's just good to see 
Stearns take accountability for the moves that he's made, and it just seemed like nothing worked. And that hater trade absolutely fractured that locker room. I had said it. I've been saying it. I had people coming over. Well, you got to give it a chance. No, the hell I don't. You can see it. And none of the guys that came across for the, in that trade, none of the surrounding moves after that trade, none of it worked. It was a collapse. And Stearns is, is, is a big part to blame because he puts this team together. Matt Arnold is another. He's, a, he's the actual GM. It's good to see accountability. But unless there's change that comes along with that accountability, it really means nothing. So we'll see if there's any true change in the types of guys, type of bats that Stearns goes and, and tries to get after. The type of pitching that he tries to go and get after. The acquisitions that he tries to go and get after. We'll be keeping an eye on that, but their season is done. Postseason baseball has been phenomenal. It's just unfortunate that the Brewers aren't a part of it. All right, let's keep moving on toss, state of the state, and let's stop off in Milwaukee with the Bucks. Yes, they went winless in the preseason, but who cares? It's preseason. They have their eyes on the prize. I know it's a cliche, but they truly do. This is a team with a championship DNA. They carried themselves in the gold of the Larry O'Brien trophy. They have their mentality. They know what's more important. Preseason ain't one of them. Their season begins on Thursday, October 20th, as we record this program on Wednesday, October 19th, against the 76ers who lost to Boston in the season opener just last night. Bucks are going to kind of have to tread water to begin this season. You've got some guys, some, some major guys on this team that are going to be out. They're injured. Now we know about Chris Middleton. At wrist surgery, he's going to be out. Obviously, that's a big blow. You know how much you missed him in the playoffs. Pat Connaughton, he's going to be out for a few weeks with a calf strain. Big-time performer off the bench. You're definitely going to miss him. Joe Ingles, someone you acquired, he's still recovering from off-season ACL surgery. Bucks GM, John Horst said a more realistic time frame for Joe Ingles to be back on the court and, and playing for the Bucks is, is in January. So you still got a while for him to come back into the fold. So you're going to have to tread water, which is, which is okay. Because even with Milton being out and dealing with kind of a inconsistent rotation in the playoffs, you still took the Celtics to seven games. You still have a chance to win that. Should have won that. But you did not. Now you're talking the regular season. And you can tread water against the teams that are not going to be that great, which at this point we don't know who's going to be who. It's the beginning of the season. But you're going to have to do your best to try and stack wins until those guys start to come back. And then you take off. My thing is, I'm hoping to stay out of the play-in. I'm hoping they stay out of the play-in because you don't want any part of that situation. Get out to a good start. Continue to learn. Continue to grow as a team. Get better. Don't peak too soon. You get these guys back, you're going to have to go through an acclimation period with them. But hopefully that all materializes before you get to the playoffs. And I truly believe this team will make the playoffs. It's a really good team. I think people continue to forget how good they are. 
You get other teams mentioned before them. Like, of course, you get the Warriors mentioned before them. They're, they're the defending champions now. Celtics defending Eastern Conference champions. But now you got the Clippers being mentioned before the Bucs. And, and you up with, I mean, you got a returning Kawhi Leonard. You have a healthy John Wall. It's a lot to be excited about out there. But I truly think that people forget how good this team truly is. Some of us know. Some of us realize that. That's why you look at these injuries like, yeah, they suck. But I think this team is good enough to tread water until you start getting those guys back. And when they do get those guys back, this, that, at that point, that's the launch pad. Team's going to take off at that point. I'm excited for Bucks basketball to return. Trust me, I am. Had a sip with that sour taste of the Celtics beating them in the second round. For the remainder of summer, part of fall, it's time to go and rectify that. But that's the state of the state. The Green Bay Packers are struggling at three and three. They're going up against an equally struggling Washington Commanders team on Sunday. They need to get right offensively, defensively, and special teams. Start that now. The Brewers, David Stearns, finally taking some accountability for the hatchet job on that team that caused them to collapse, namely that hater train. Admitted it was wrong. Finally good to see some accountability. And the Milwaukee Bucks season about to start. They're going to have to tread some water with some major injuries. But I think they'll be able to do so. And when those guys get back, it's going to be a launch pad. It's time for us to run the toss sweep. Facebook.com slash T on Sports Show is your home for Toss on Facebook. We touch on a lot of subjects there that we don't necessarily get a chance to on the show. Again, that's Facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. That's T O N Sports Show. Sporting News is a site that I like to frequent and read up on, especially for some fantasy football, but overall, it's just a good site. I'm not looking at my own, TossOnChainMedia.com. They came out with their predictions for the 2022-2023 NBA regular season. Actually, it's a little bit beyond the regular season because they also have a finals prediction on there. Now, if y'all have been paying attention to my social media, you would know what that finals prediction is. Posted that on the Toss Facebook page, facebook.com slash Tons Sports Show. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Well, let's start off with what they're talking about. And this is straight from the sporting news. MVP. They're giving that award to Giannis Adetokounmpo of the Milwaukee Bucks. Many people felt he should have been MVP last season. I am included in that. I have no problem with Nikola Jokic winning it. The Joker has just been so damn good. But when you see what Giannis has done for his team, and it's not to say that Jokic didn't do a lot for his team. He was missing Jamal Murray, who's back this season, and you love to see that. It's going to make them an even better team. He definitely helped keep them afloat, got them to the playoffs. But you're talking Giannis, who had the Bucks, top three in the East. Took the eventual Eastern Conference champions to seven games in the second round without their second best player, Chris Middleton. I, I really felt that it, that MVP was his, but 
this silly voter fatigue. And again, Giannis is in a rarefied air where he could really be MVP every single year. It's the same with LeBron James. Now you got Nikola Jokic in that air. Like they could be MVP every single year. That's just how damn good they are. But the sporting news is giving him that award this year. You love to see it. Rookie of the year. The sporting news is giving that to Paulo Banchero of the Magic. It was a pretty good rookie class this season. At least via the draft, they haven't really played the games yet. If anyone's more polished and ready for the NBA game, I think it's Banchero. I'd have to agree with this one only because we haven't played the games. We have not seen the games. We have not seen the full season from them. It's a very real possibility that he gets usurped by somebody else. We don't know. But as we stand here at this point, he's the most polished and ready for the NBA. I had to give it to Paulo. Defensive player of the year. The Sporting News is giving to Rudy Gobert. I don't agree. <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree. This is a legacy award. The man's won this thing three times already. If you look back last season, and again, he finished, I think he finished top three last season. Last season, I don't even agree with Marcus Smart having won it. I felt Giannis should have won Defensive Player of the Year. But at the last month, month and a half, there's this campaign for Marcus Smart to win it. And he and his, the media members that went along with it usurped that award, and they gave it to Marcus Smart, okay? He's got that under his belt now. There's nothing you can do about it. But I don't agree with it, just like I don't agree with this one. I don't think it would be Rudy Gobert. I think it's a really good chance, especially with the defensive changes that the Bucks are making, that Giannis could very well be defensive player of the year for the second time in his career. He should have been last year. I think he will get it this year. But that award, if it could be usurped, Within a month and a half, who knows? Six man of the year. Sporting News is giving that to Jordan Poole. I, I really don't see a problem with that. The, the man took a huge step forward with his game last season. Became an NBA champion. I mean, you could just see the excitement on his face during ring night the other night. He's earned it, got himself a fat contract because of the work he's put in, and now he's flourishing, and he's really found his home out there and, and, and with Golden State. I don't have a problem with that one. You might want to watch Jordan Clarkson, but that's if Jordan Clarkson still comes off the bench, especially with all the trades that the Jazz have made. I'm probably, I don't think that that's going to happen, so he'll probably be starting. But Jordan Poole, have no problem with that one. Coach of the year, they're giving to Tyron Liu of the Clippers, and honestly, I could see that. You got a returning Kawhi Leonard. They acquired John Wall. He's back, healthy. His mind is right. He's ready to go. Paul George. Man, I mean, they, they've got a lot of talent out there, and you know he's going to coach them up to play some defense, and with the team that has Paul George and Kawhi Leonard on it, you know they're going to play some defense. I don't really have a problem with this one. I mean, it's if he can do what we all believe he can do with that talent, with again, with a returning Kawhi Leonard, with a healthy Paul George, a healthy John Wall. If we if he does what we believe he can do, I I definitely see that happening for him. So I don't have I don't have a disagreement with that award. Their playoff predictions for the Eastern Conference, the one seed Philly. Two seed Milwaukee, three seed Boston, four seed the Nets, five seed Cavaliers. I don't know. I think the Cavaliers might be a little bit higher. Six seed Atlanta, the seventh seed Miami, the eighth seed Toronto, and this is for playing tournament purposes only. The ninth seed Chicago and the tenth seed the New York Knicks. There's some in here. I, I I agree with all the teams in here. I think with the Hornets reacquiring Steve Clifford as their head coach. You're talking about an offensive laden team, the team that could put up some, some real points as we saw last season. He's going to try to get those young guys, those young cats to get down and play some defense in a grinded out offense. I don't know if that's really going to work. I don't really know if that's going to work. 
I agree with all the playoff teams in here. I just don't know if I totally agree with the order. Western Conference playoff teams, the Sporting News has the Clippers as the one seed, Golden State two, Denver three, Phoenix four, Memphis five, Minnesota six, Dallas seven, New Orleans eight, the Lakers nine, and the Kings 10th. Again, 7 through 10 are for playing purposes only. They're really high on the Kings for some reason. I'm not that high on the Kings. I don't know that they make it. Pelicans, if Zion stays healthy, if Brandon Ingram stays healthy, if C.J. McCollum stays healthy, they will make the playoffs, but I don't know if they'll be the eight seed. I think they have a chance to be in that sixth discussion. We shall see. I, I just don't know if the Kings will, will even make the playing tournament. I just, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that one. Most of this, yes. The order may be different, but I don't know about the Kings making the playoffs. I don't know about that one. Now, according to their article, they have the Eastern Conference champions being the 76ers. They have the Western Conference champions being the Clippers. They have the NBA champions being the Clippers. But if you saw on the clip on the Toss Facebook page, the Sporting News actually said that it was the Milwaukee Bucks being Eastern Conference champions. The Clippers are Western Conference champions. They had that, and that matched the article. But then they also said that the Milwaukee Bucks would defeat the L.A. Clippers in the NBA Finals to be NBA champions. So that is a very bold prediction. It's very possible. You certainly hope for it. But it's really funny how they have their article up. And it says one thing. And their story said a completely different thing. I don't know what time, 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 kind of game they're trying to pull. Don't know. I'm not going to give my prediction because they have to play the games. I like to leave playoff time, the playoff time. I'm very much looking forward to the season. Again, we're already underway. Season opener, game, opener was last night. Good to have the NBA back. Well, y'all. Time for me to get on up out of here. This is episode 119 of Toss, Tristan on Sports Show. We got all sorts of sounds going on here. <laughs> hey, we live, folks. You know where to find me. <laughs> on social media, at the two zero double. That's at the, the number two, the number zero, and the word double. Facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. Your home. The toss on Facebook page. Again, we touch on a lot of things there that we don't necessarily get a chance to on this program. That's facebook.com slash T on sports show. That's T O N sports show. And of course, tossnationmedia.com. Your home for the toss brand of sports. Truthful, opinionated, passionate sports. It's what you deserve. But as I said before, it's time for me to get on up out of here. This is T Square, Tristan Thomas, reminding all of you to keep it moving forward. Always forward. Forward always. Until next week. So long. From Toss.